a good morning or afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jan Riker, Chief Operating Officer of the Antibody Society. Today's webinar is one in a series designed to inform and educate our members, as well as the broader scientific community, about topics relating to antibody discovery and development. Our expert speaker, Dr. Long Xu, will discuss the pros and cons of innovative technologies and platforms that can be applied to antibody discovery. Please note this webinar is being recorded. Please do add any and all questions to the Q&A box in the viewer and those questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Without further ado, I'll now turn the show over to our speaker. Um, hi, everyone. And uh, I would like to thank the Antibody Society for the opportunity to speak here. And a special thanks to Janice and her colleagues for their tremendous help. And today I'm going to show um, about new techs and uh, platforms to empower antibody discovery. Over the past three decades, uh, the development of antibody drugs are rapid and promising. And we are seeing more and more antibody drugs entering the market. And in 2021, FDA approved the hundreds antibody drugs. And uh, now we are entered the era of 100 plus antibody drugs. And antibody drugs are gaining more and more share of the global pharmaceutical market. And this table lists top 10 best selling drugs in the first half of 2023. You can see that uh, out of top 10, seven are antibody drugs including all the top three, and that's phenomenal. And why antibody drugs or biological drugs uh, have such good performance? The reason is that biological uh, drugs, you know, they have some unique and special uh, advantages over small molecule drugs, such as the beta affinity, uh, beta binding specificity, and the better tissue selectivity, and so on. And all these are increasingly favored in clinic applications. Okay, the trend looks very good and encouraging, but it is far from perfect. And uh, we all know that the antibody industry has been constantly troubled by a series of bottlenecks such as big size, poor tissue permeability, and a difficulty in modular applications, and uh, you know many uh, uh, antibodies ha have low affinity and uh, not high enough to become drugs, and all, and also we came across a lot of um, problems associated with immunogenicity. And these bottlenecks are calling for new options to break through. And we think that single domain antibodies may be a new option. And uh, I assume you know, most of our attendees have a rough idea about the chemically the derived uh, single domain antibodies. Uh, you can see uh, the picture shows the comparison between conventional antibody and uh, and uh, commonly the derived heavy chain only antibody. Okay, so it's interesting that we found that in uh, camelids, you know, in their blood, there 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 are naturally uh, a lot of um, heavy chain only antibodies with light chains missing, and the, the variable domains of these heavy chain antibody are called VHH or narrow bodies because their size are just in narrow meter range and which offers them a lot of unique features such as good stability and good uh, permeability. Okay, more than that, so you can see that uh, they, 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 they are pretty stable in some very extreme conditions 
and uh, they have you know great potential you know for uh, as a modules for downstream engineering and they have very good solubility and they have higher homo homology to human antibody uh, heavy chains and also they are compatible with uh, a, a variety of production system okay and these advantages you know enable you know, the narrow bodies in a wider range of applications uh, such as uh, therapeutic antibodies uh, or uh, diagnostic tools. Say the narrow body can be used to construct bispecific or multi-specific antibodies. They can also form the conjugates with toxin payloads or enzyme or uh, um, radio isotopes and they can be used in CAR-T or narrow particle drug delivery systems. Okay. Uh, at the same time, they, they, they have great potentials to use the in uh, molecule, molecular diagnostics or as uh, Im imaging reagents, you know, uh, due to their uh, good properties such as deep tissue penetrations and a quick clearance from blood. Okay. Since VHH or narrow body is so good, and how to use it? Uh, here you can see a uh, workflow. And uh, first, of all, first of all, we have to do antibody discovery. The starting point is to immunize commonly the species and uh, generate the antibody library. Then screen hits from the library against a given antigen. Then perform function assays on the kids to identify uh, lead antibodies with application potential. Next is uh, do the lead optimization, including humanization and uh, affinity maturation. Okay, after these steps and the hopefully the <laughs> lead antibody you know meet all the requirements and so they can enter the final stage application. And actually, there are many methods for animal immunizations and uh, antibody screening. And today, I will mainly talk about phage display technology. Okay, this picture will give you a brief demonstration of uh, phage display used in uh, narrow body discovery. Um, phage display is a reliable method for narrow body uh, discovery and uh, and actually we begin with you know the uh, alpaca immunization with a given antigen and then uh, we obtain pbmc from the alpacas and then enrich b cells capture its message inas reverse transcribe it into a cdna library and then the vhh genes got PCR amplified and cloned into phage meat. And then uh, the, the phage meat transformed into competent cells so that, you know, the phage can display the VHH on their surfaces. And this method allow for the construction of phage libraries capable of expressing a vast connection of VHH variants. The library size is typically more than 10 to the ninth power. But actually, what we want is just dozens of hits. Okay, that's, you can see the huge difference from 10 to the power of nine to the dozens of hits. It, it, it's, it, it's clearly very difficult. It's like, you know, finding a needle in a haystack. Okay. But, you know, we just use a very simple antigen antibody binding uh, mechanism. Okay, so we run several runs of penny to isolate, you know, the good hits. Okay. So what, 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 what do we do? Okay, um, so in each round, 
phases that can bind specifically to the given antigen uh, are isolated and uh, amplified, while those phages uh, don't bind antigens get washed out. Okay, so in this way, the positive phages that uh, has desired binding properties are dramatically enriched in the library. Okay, so usually after three rounds of uh, panning, the positive rate can reach double digit percentages. At this point, we can pick monoclonal phages from the library to do the ELISA binding assays to identify the positive phages and then sequence them to obtain the VHH gene. Okay, next I will uh, show with you a complete case from the uh, narrow body, you know, discovery until the uh, applications. And in this case, the antigen is called X. It's actually a cell surface receptor expressed uh, on T cells. And uh, it is also a co-stimulator for T cell activations. Okay. So this just to show uh, the immunization uh, is pretty good. You know, the alpaca uh, got well immunized. Yeah. And uh, the title uh, looks very good after the second round of immunization. So we collect the PBMC after the second round of immunization for the construction of uh, the phage library. And here are some QC steps and uh, you can see some uh, tests done during the construction of the VHH library, such as uh, uh, insertion rate, library size, and uh, diversity of the VHH sequences. Uh, you can see that our library size uh, is 10 to the power of nine. And uh, the diversity check shows that, uh, okay, um, not many duplicate sequences. So that means uh, the diversity of our uh, phage library is pretty good. Okay, so in the panning stages, we use both solid phase and the liquid phase panning. Okay, we, uh, this is a solid phase panning. You can see that the title of the phage pool improved greatly after each round of panning. And uh, that indicates that the enrichment of the positive phage is great. And then um, we selected, we randomly selected about a thousand clones. And uh, finally, about 360 clones are identified as positive clones. And then um, after sequencing, 11 unique sequences are obtained. Uh, this shows the uh, uh, results from the liquid phase panning. It's similar. You can see that um, so out of thousands of clones selected and uh, 952 clones are uh, identified as positive. And then we got 43 unique sequences. So totally from both liquid and uh, solid panning, we got 54 unique sequences. So, so that's our 54 hits. Then we performed a series of functional assays, you know, to um, characterize those uh, 54 hits, you know, to identify the good late antibodies with good application potentials. Uh, the first assay is ELISA binding assay, okay. Uh, it's pretty simple, just to, you know, to 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 uh, check if you know the these uh, hits can, can can specifically bind to the antigen X. Okay, the pictures the the, the results are here. You can see you know the uh, binding curve are pretty good actually. Um, out of fifty four hits, thirty five antibodies show very good binding curves. And then 
all these heats are subjected to um, very accurate um, affinity data measurement on Biarco platform. Uh, here just to show some Biarco uh, graphs, okay. And uh, uh, actually, 49 out of 54 heats show uh, clear, you know, binding against the X in SPR tests. And uh, the affinity of the heat ranges from 10 to the minus seven power to 10 to the minus 10. Okay, you can see the bar graph here. Actually, uh, you can see that most of the our heats, their affinity uh, falls into the range of 10 to the uh, minus eight power or better. So that uh, is a pretty good. Okay, so um, here we're trying to examine, you know, the binding properties of our heats against uh, the cells, okay. In the previous slides, you see they have good binding properties against the uh, uh, antigen proteins. Now we want to examine, you know, the binding properties uh, on the cell level, okay. So all these heats uh, are examined by the flow cytometry against the uh, uh, Chou-K1. Chou-K1 cells overexpressing um, the antigen X. And uh, the, 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 the binding curves are shown here. You can see that uh, out of 54 hits, 43 uh, VHH antibodies by, bind against the Choke one cells over expressing antigen X. So that means, you know, uh, most of our kids, they, they have very good binding properties against uh, the, the, the antigen X, uh, even, you know, uh, at the cell level. Uh, that's an interesting uh, essay. Uh, it's used to examine the antibodies agonist activity. Okay, uh, actually here we use a, a Luciferous report uh, system. Okay, so the the, mechan the mechanism behind it is, you can see the picture actually. So when the, um, the, the, when the, the antibody uh, binds specifically uh, against the antigen X, you know, on the cell surface, that can, you know, that signal can uh, promote the production of luciferous and uh, which reacts with its uh, substrates to produce uh, luminescence, okay? And the intensity of luminescence is positively correlated with the antibody's agonist activity, okay? So that's interesting. And uh, let me see the performance of our hits and uh, uh, have a look at this bar graph. The, 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 the blue bar are the positive control. You can see, you know, the uh, luminescence intensity is high. The red bar are the isotope control, okay? And all these green bars are part of our heats, okay? And, uh, and we, so when the lu luminescence intensity is, you know, greater than 1.5 times of uh, isotope, we can we can we can say that you know the 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 agonist activity is clearly is clearly uh, over there. So we checked all our hits, and uh, actually um, there are 31 out of 53 hits show clear agonist activity. Okay, now then this essay uh, is used to determine the uh, ability of the VHH to block interaction between the ligands and the cell membrane bound antigen X. Uh, so the results are still satisfactory. And uh, 
out of 51 hits uh, used in these essays, actually 44 antibodies show blocking effect. Oh, that's a, a big part. Okay. So after uh, screening and the characterization of all these hits, um, we actually uh, selected several uh, leads and uh, and uh, performed the first uh, optimization uh, to meet the objects uh, to, uh, the, the, the the objectives of the project, and then they are ready for the applications. In, in this case, uh, they are used in the construction of therapeutic uh, by specific antibodies, and uh, actually. Uh, we are able to uh, construct a, a variety of common forms of bispecific antibodies. Okay, so the above uh, case is pretty straightforward and, uh, and you can see the results are satisfactory and everything seems uh, very smooth. <laughs> but actually in our daily um, work, we uh, came across a lot of challenges. Here's just uh, one, say, um, what if it is difficult to prepare soluble uh, proteins and antigens? You know, uh, actually, uh, in the previous case, we use soluble protein X as antigens. So it's, it's pretty straightforward and simple. But in many cases, okay, such as you know, transmembrane targets or GPCR targets, or we cannot prepare you know, soluble proteins and antigens because once this, this antigen is detached from the, the, the cell membrane, it loses its proper structures and uh, functions. Okay, um, that's a huge challenge. What should we do in this case? Okay, here is another case, and uh, the goal of this of the, this project is trying to um, identify the the clotting eighteen point two antibodies. Okay, oh, we know that clotting eighteen point two cannot be prepared as soluble protein. So, in the animal immunization, in the first two rounds of immunization, we use a DNA plasmid encoding coding 18.2 as antigen. And actually you can see the title of the first two rounds, not that good. Then in the later three rounds of immunization, we use a, a CHO K1 overexpressing cell line as antigens. Okay, and the title of and the title, you can see a big jump, you know, uh, especially after the fifth round of immunization. Okay, so so at this point, the the the, the immunization is good enough for the construction of phage library. And then we run, we performed the three rounds of uh, uh, panning. After each round of panning, we uh, randomly select 88 clones and uh, to um, for the expression and the validation and uh, the, 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 so the, the, the case is pretty lucky actually uh, even after the first round of uh, panning we obtained some positive clones and unique sequences so totally um, you know from 200 something clones we got we got dozens of positive clones and uh, uh, actually it's 13 unique sequences. And we um, expressed these hits uh, for validation. And uh, so here are the, you know, fi finally we, 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 we selected the top four hits, you know, to uh, the top yeah, the, okay, so you can see the, 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 the uh, lower left, the graph just shows the top four heat and they, the, the, their binding curve against the, uh, the, the cells, the, uh, the cells overexpressing protein uh, 18.2. Uh, 
okay, so uh, clearly the binding properties is what we desired. And at the same time, we run some um, control experiment and uh, say when the uh, blank 293 cells used and there's no binding at all. And uh, the, the lower right picture, you can see that here the 293 cells over expressing coding 18.1 is used and there's no binding at all. But that's pretty good. Uh, because we know that actually um, between coding 18.1 and uh, coding 18.2, actually there's only seven amino acid differences in ECD. Uh, but, you know, uh, on our platform, we successfully, uh, you know, uh, identify and isolate such good hits that can specifically uh, bind against coding 18.2. Okay, here's another uh, challenge that people may ask. So, uh, can we use a naive phage display library instead of the uh, Alpaca immune antibody library? The answer is a big yes, because we have our own Alpaca range. Um, we have uh, more than 300 Alpaca. <laughs> so, based on uh, 300 Alpaca donors, um, we collected their PBMCs and uh, uh, using phage display technology and constructed the, the huge naive uh, alpaca uh, phage display library. And our library size is more than uh, 10 to the power of 12. That's pretty huge. And here is a case, you know, we just use our naive alpaca antibody library directly uh, for screening, for anybody screening. Okay, so actually we uh, performed the three rounds of liquid phase panning. After each round of panning, we randomly select 88 uh, monoclonal clones. And uh, finally, so out of 264 clones, uh, exactly 100 positive clones are identified. And these 100, these 100 positive clones are sent for uh, sequencing. And finally, we got 18 unique sequences. And we expressed all these 18 uh, hits. And here are the top, top five, top five hits. And you can see their affinity is pretty good. Some are even, even better than the positive control, the, 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 the red codes, okay. So, so that means, uh, you know, uh, with naive library, we can successfully uh, screen for, uh, you know, the uh, narrow body with desired binding uh, properties. And uh, uh, this slide just to show some statistics results. Okay, we collect, uh, you know, uh, the the the. Uh, 600 something uh, unique sequences we deliver to our clients and uh, and uh, it is interesting that actually one third of our uh, hits uh, their affinity are uh, in the 10 to the minus 8 power range another one third is just in the uh, narrow more range and some are even you know better than that so totally, we can say that 80% of our uh, BHH hits have, you know, the affinity of uh, 10 to the minus 8 power or even better. So that means our uh, library, our uh, immunization and our phage display technology are pretty good to screen for uh, quality uh, VHH hits. Okay. Um, then I would like to say something about you know the the, the uh, antibody uh, optimization because uh, we know that usually the uh, VHH or narrow bodies um, they they are pretty good 
But usually their affinity are not that high enough to become drugs. Usually their affinity is in uh, 10 to the minus 8 uh, power. That's not good enough. So next I will introduce our uh, proprietary affinity maturation platform. We call it MCMS. And uh, it's for coverage mammalian expression system for affinity maturation. Our platform features for coverage and no buyers. And how we do that? The, this workflow gives you a rough idea. We know that, you know, as to the, um, anybody's binding, um, uh, properties, uh, it's mostly determined by its, uh, CDR regions. So we focused on the CDR regions. And for each amino acid position in CDR regions, we generate a, a site saturated, um, a, a site saturated mutant plasmid library. The library cover uh, 17 single point mutation at this position. Uh, why 17? Because, you know, the original amino acid, um, methionine and uh, cysteine, these three are excluded. Okay. So then the, okay. So then the mutant plasmid library is transformed into competent cells and the cell culture is then sprayed on uh, agar plates. Each agar plate corresponds to one specific position in CDR regions. Okay, and the clones on each agar plate covers all 17 mutant plasmids at that position. Oh, then we randomly select uh, 88 clones from each agar plate and cultured in 96 well plates for plasmid amplification and extraction. Why 88? Because based on our experience, 88 clones may cover all 17 mutant plasmids which is confirmed by the uh, sequencing results. You know, on the right, you can see that, that just uh, the sequence results from one plate. You see uh, the 88 plasmid cover all 17 uh, mutant plasmids. And then the plasmid uh, moved from the 96 well plates to another 96 deep well plate to express to the antibody in our high throughput expression system. Okay, I want to, uh, 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 to to point out that so up to this point, for each amino acid in CDR region, we end up with one ninety six plate, with each well containing antibody supernatant expressed by a single point mutant plasmid at that position. So you can see the workload is pretty huge, because. Uh, Say if there's 70 uh, amino acid positions in CDR regions, we end up with 70 plates. That is over 6,000 wells of antibody supernatants. Okay, so with so many wells of supernatants, we can do the high throughput ELISA uh, screening assays, okay, to identify hot spots. So what are hotspots? Hotspots are refers to the mutations, to, to, to the wells, you know, wells, the supernatants show significantly higher uh, affinity than the parental antibody. Okay. So once we identify the hotspots, we can go back to, 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 uh, to find the, you know, the corresponding plasmid and do the sequencing to identify exactly what mutation at that position, uh, you know, caused such affinity increase. So after the ELISA uh, essays, we collect, you know, abundant hotspot information. Then we select, you know, uh, couples of hotspots and uh, then do the combination and uh, design the dozens of candidate antibody sequences. These dozens of candidate antibody sequences are got, will be expressed and purified and then subjected to, uh, SPR test on BRCO to make sure that, you know, we finally, we got 
the, uh, the, 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 the antibody sequences that have you know, significantly increased affinity. Okay, I hope you can understand, you know, the, 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 the story behind this workflow. It's a little complicated. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I just, uh, you know, go through some cases of affinity uh, maturation. Uh, as I just mentioned that narrow bodies usually have um, poor affinity. Say here are two examples, you know, uh, they are all in the 10 to the minus eight range. And uh, the, 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 you know, the binding, the binding uh, rate on the left is, is pretty slow. While the uh, dissociation right, the, the, the dissociation rate on the right is too fast. And what should we do? Okay. So for the, uh, the, the, the nanobodies with poor, um, uh, with the poor binding rate, we need to improve its KR. And uh, on our platform, we identify these five hotspots and we do the uh, combinatorial expression. And here are top, you know, uh, candidate, candidate uh, antibody sequences and show very good results. We can see from the lower graphs that and after the affinity maturation, the, you know, the, the binding, the, the binding curve of the antibodies are, you know, much better than the parental antibodies. And we can also see the data, you know, on the uh, upright, you know, uh, upright corner. And, uh, yeah, actually the, the, after the optimization, the antibody uh, affinity increased up to uh, more than eightfold. And we can clearly see that, you know, their KR increased, you know, very significantly. Okay, here is the second case that we uh, very, uh, the, 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 the dissociation rate is too fast, then we have to lower down its KR. Okay, so in this case, on our platform, we identify these top four hotspots. We do the combination and design the candidate sequences and do the expression. So here are uh, three, uh, you know, sequences with good performance. We can see that, you know, from the graph that the dissociation curve improves a lot and uh, the affinity of the antibodies increased uh, from six fold to 23 fold. And we can also clearly see that the value, the KD value, you know, uh, decreased greatly after the optimization. And uh, here's another case that's that, that that's 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 a big project, you know, uh, starting from the uh, narrow body discovery uh, and then followed by uh, humanization. Okay, and uh, then after our uh, affinity uh, maturation we can see that the improvement of the affinity is uh, tremendous <laughs> and uh, um, it's up to, you know, uh, more than 260 fold. That, 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 that's a very successful case. Okay. Um, okay, so I've just uh, talked about um, a lot of cases of antibody discovery by the phage display technology. And some of our attendees may argue that uh, the phage di display approach is it's not bad, but it's still very, you know, time consuming and labor intensive. And uh, can we have beta option? And uh, say, can we have a, you know, a magic microscope, you know, with that we can have a close look at each B cell and tell if the antibody, you know, uh, secreted by B cell has a desired antigen binding properties. <laughs> I don't know if there's such a magic microscope in the world, but we actually have an antibody high speed sorting platform, you know, which has very similar magic power. And I would like to share with you. And actually, this picture just to show you, you know, the sorting process. 
actually. Um, we begin with uh, a mouse immunization. And uh, then actually the B cells are obtained and enriched from the spleen of immunized mouse. Okay, these enriched B cells are added to the microfluidic platform for sorting. The platform can generate millions of uh, picoliter volume droplets, very tiny. And each droplet contains up to one B cell, okay? Up to one B cell together with uh, antigens and uh, secondary antibodies. Okay, then each droplet will pass through the detector. The detector uh, can tell, you know, which droplet contains a good B cell. What is good B cell? Good B cell means that, you know, the B cell inside can secrete antibody with desired binding properties to the given antigen. Okay. Well, that, that sounds magic. And how can the, our detector tell it is good or bad? Okay. The, the criteria for judging is simple. <laughs> Actually, they're based on the uh, specific rate of fluorescent signal. Okay. And uh, the, 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 the rate of fluorescent signals confirms that, you know, such a sandwich structure has been created in the droplet. You can see almost at the center of the picture that it shows you the sandwich structure. Okay, which includes the, you know, the antibody secreted by the B cells and uh, the antibody binds to both antigen and uh, secondary antibodies. Both antigen and the secondary antibodies are fluorescently labeled. Okay, so interestingly, when the antigen is excited, it, it's emitted light, fluorescent light, will, ex will excite the secondary antibody. The secondary antibody will emit the, that specific red fluorescent signal. Okay. Okay. So it is called the Fred effect. Okay. So when a droplet with Fred effect pass through the detector, a significantly enhanced red fluorescent signal is detected. In this way, good B cells can be collected and bad B cells go to waste directly. That's a very uh, smart design. Okay, so we have collected um, good B cell pool. And what should we do next? And next, on a micro well plate, each good B cell is paired with a barcoded bead. You can see that the, 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 the orange one is a, is a, is a barcoded bead. And the, the, the blue one, the blue one is a good B cell. Okay. The, uh, the bead is covered with millions of primers to capture the message INA uh, released from the lysed B cell, which is then, you know, reverse transcribed and uh, amplified and followed by you know, the sequencing and the bioinformatics analysis, and uh, you know, which result in tons of sequence information. Okay, uh, people may ask, okay, you get tons of you know uh, sequence information of heavy chains and light chains, but how do we pair them together correctly? Okay, here is another smart design. Actually, on each uh, barcoded bit, you know, the primer carries unique barcode. And the, the smart design is that the primers on the same, on the same bit carries the same unique barcode, while the primers on different bits, you know, carries different barcode. So we know that when the, 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 uh, uh, message RNA or the CDNA or the, the PCR amplification products, when if they come from the same the same lysed B cell, they must carry the same barcode. So with that unique barcode information, we can correctly pair cognate light chain and heavy chains. Okay, so this high speed you know anybody sorting platform. Uh, greatly 
lower than the, you know, or speed up the antibody discovery. Uh, usually, you know, we know that the phage display platform uh, costs us, you know, several months. But here, you know, with that single B cell sorting platform, the sorting process can be done within one day if everything goes smoothly. <laughs> uh, that's phenomenal. And uh, this picture just to show a typical um, results, you know, and you can see that we got many hundreds of uh, sequences, you know, from the uh, good B cells, and uh, you know, each light chain and heavy chain are paired correctly based on their unique barcode information. <coughs> okay, I would like to show um, this case with you. It's it, just uh, you know, uh, it was done on our. Um, high-speed uh, single B cell antibody sorting platform. It's used to uh, screen for uh, PD-1 antibody. <laughs> and uh, actually, um, the, 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 our single B cell sorting platform uh, returns you know, hundreds of uh, sequences to us. And uh, we, uh, we selected uh, uh, 62 hits, okay? And then do the uh, antibody expression and the validation. And here, just uh, one of the essays that's uh, um, it's a uh, ELISA binding essay. You can see that most of most of the of the hits show very good binding against the PD one, and uh, the barcode show here actually uh, fifty nine out of sixty two show positive binding against PD one. That's pretty good. And uh, the affinity is also very good. And uh, uh, most of them are in the range of um, 10 to the, uh, 10 to the uh, minus 9 power. That is nanomolar range. And uh, some are even better. OK, then we um, performed this um, uh, ligand blocking assay. And, uh, and uh, we also find that Eight hits show very good um, blocking effects. Okay, so that's uh, an interesting result. Actually, it's done by our, our new platform. It's called the Katera. It's 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 Katera is kind of the enhanced version of Yako, <laughs> and we do the uh, high throughput SPR based uh, epitope binning, and uh, epitope binning can tell us, you know. Can you know they can group, group you know the the, the antibody you know, which uh, show similar uh, binding epitope, and uh, it's interesting because we know there are many uh, PD1 antibodies available uh, on the market. We just chose two, bisimilar one and bisimilar two, and uh, and that, that we, we we use these two together with our uh, sixty something hits. <laughs> And then run the epitope binning uh, by Katera. Uh, the results are interesting, and actually, 19 of our kids yeah, show very similar uh, epitope, you know, as by similar one. But none of our kids show a similar epitope <laughs> uh, as by similar two. That, 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 that's interesting. And we also this on the left you can see the pylogenetic tree that just uh, indicate the diversity of our uh, heat sequences. Uh, you can see that uh, these trees shows that the, 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 the diversity of our heat is pretty good. Okay, uh, so here's, that comes to the end of my presentation. And uh, it's, it's my great honor to have the chance to share with all the attendees uh, and, uh, so, any questions and comments are welcome. And uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, due to the time limit, you know, some details are not expanded. Uh, so, um, you, so you are welcome to you know contact us, uh, and uh, you're welcome to discuss with us. We uh, I have list uh, have my email address over there, and you can also uh, browse our. Oh, website. <laughs> okay.
Thank you very much Thanks. for that presentation. We do have a, a few questions. So we've got a couple of minutes here to uh, have you answer those questions. What is the typical period of time for nanobody discovery with phage display platform at your company? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, many people are interested uh, in the timelines, actually. Um, I would say it's about, usually it's in a typical um, discovery project costs less than four months. And uh, okay, the, 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 the most important and the time consuming part is uh, um, alpaca immunization. It usually costs say about two months because we, we have to you know, run several rounds of immunization until the title uh, is satisfactory. Next question also deals with time. What is the typical throughput turnaround time for the functional assay for a new target? For a new target. Uh, functional assay. Okay, so uh, it really depends because there are a variety of functional assays. Some are pretty, um, pretty fast. Some are pretty <laughs> time consuming. Say, say, uh, uh, high throughput ELISA uh, binding assays usually just cost us say two to three days. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty fast. But in some assays, you know, we need to construct uh, cell lines or um, spend more time to prepare materials, it's, it's time consuming. <laughs> so usually we will discuss with our clients to, to, to make sure that, you know, uh, which are, what essays are they most interested in and, uh, and they want us to perform these essays for them. Very good, good communication with the client is critical. Next question, could you comment on developability parameters specifically for the bi-specifics? In particular, does the placement of the fragment affect developability? <laughs> okay, that's a very important question and uh, it's also a very big question. I, I think that to answer that question, we need another several webinars <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, I would say that by specific antibodies are um, uh, pretty important, pretty important uh, in the development of antibody drugs. Um, but currently we still face a lot of challenges because, you know, um, actually we, we, we we haven't have a very uh, thoroughly uh, understanding of the bispecific antibody. Um, you know, even the, the first step, say the construction of bi construction and expression of bispecific antibody is a big is a big challenge. We often see that you know we can hardly uh, obtain the very uh, homogeneous antibody forms we expected. And uh, we often see some um, unexpected, say, uh, precipitates or, 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 or poor structures. And uh, yeah, all, I think all these are associated with, you know, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the knowledge, you know, uh, that, you know, requires, uh, you know, to achieve uh, better understanding of by specific um, by specific antibodies and say think you know the, the, the so to me the, the most important parameters uh, first of all is uh, uh, stability <laughs> and uh, the, 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 uh, the good expression level and uh, the uh, and uh, and uh, uh, purity and uh, th 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 these are Usually, we, we we came across a lot of troubles with, with, with that. You know, you know, if we cannot tackle these uh, challenges, we cannot, you know, 
talk about its say uh, application potentials or or others. <laughs> So there aren't really generalizable things to say here. Yep. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Next question is, can you comment on potential immunogenicity of VHH? Do you do humanization after lead selection? What are the difficulties during humanization that you may face? Okay, actually I mentioned in my presentation that uh, narrow bodies have high homo homology to human heavy antibody heavy chain. So it usually think that the um, it you know its it, immunogenicity is you know much better than you know uh, mouse derived antibodies or rabbit derived antibody. Um, so not all narrow body. Uh, you know, requires humanization. But in some case, when, you know, the client want to do the narrow body um, humanization, it's actually um, more difficult than conventional <laughs> antibodies because as you can see that the narrow body are just one tenth size of the conventional um, antibodies. So the, 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 the operation room is Pretty small, okay. <laughs> and uh, usually, um, when we do the uh, humanization with a conventional antibody, we can easily achieve um, ninety-five plus, you know, uh, percent uh, uh, humanization. Okay, but as to narrow body, okay, it's, it's very difficult. Usually, the, the the humanization percentage is is around 80 percent because you know they their sequence is pretty short <laughs> but i think you know uh, as to the narrow bodies um we usually we don't worry a lot about is immunogenicity <laughs> and uh, um okay let me see um do we do humanization after lead selection okay it really depends. Depends on you know our clients' objectives and their applications. Okay. <laughs> yeah, some choose to do the humanization. Some uh, will not. Um, okay, I think the most di um, difficult part uh, in the humanization of uh, narrow bodies is a um, back mutation. Is a back mutation part. You know uh, because you know. Usually, we don't want to see many bad mutations because that will low down the percentage of humanization. But as to VHH, uh, usually it requires um, more bad mutations. <laughs> and uh, the, select, the, the selection of bad mutations should be very careful and critical for the success of the humanization of VHH. Okay, thanks very much. The next question, what is the sample size per experiment on the single B cell sorting platform? About how many positive cells can be obtained? Okay, that's a very good question. And um, actually many people are interested in that new single B cell sorting platform. And uh, we uh, usually in a typical uh, project, we load 1 million B cells you know, each one, one million. And uh, so I think that's a, that's an optical um, uh, sample size. With that, with one million uh, B cells loaded, usually, you know, the uh, encapsulation is pretty good. We, we seldom see uh, multiple B cells encapsulated, encapsulated in one um, oil droplet, okay. So yeah, yeah, you, you, you can imagine that, you know, if, if there's a huge amount of B cells loaded and uh, the, the, the chance of uh, multiple B cells encapsulated in one tiny oil droplet increased dramatically. So we tried many times and uh, we finally uh, see that one million is a, opt is a uh, optimal 
sample size. And uh, let me see, oh, how many positive cells? Okay, uh, usually uh, thousands of positive cells can be obtained after each one. Okay. Thousands. Yes, excellent, excellent. One last question on the single B cell sorting. Can you perform? Okay. So that's all. We can go ahead aspect. to the next question. Yes. The, the next question is, can you perform more than one assay in your single B cell sorting? For example, human and seno antigen binding and blocking. Or can you perform multiple rounds of sorting with a different Hi, assay? Uh, can, can you read the last question? Hi, Jenny's. Can you hear me now? Oh, uh, yes, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, I think we have the one last question. Okay. And that is, can you perform more than one assay in your B cell sorting. For example, human and seno antigen binding and blocking. Or can you perform multiple rounds of sorting with a different assay each time? Um, uh, so far it's, it's difficult. It's difficult because you know, uh, you can, yeah, think about the freight, the freight effect. You know that's a very um, sensitive and uh, and and uh, and uh, happen in tiny structure, and uh, it's hard. It's very hard, you know, to have a uh, double donor and a double receptor system in, uh, you know, uh, formed in, in, in that tiny uh, oil droplet, and it will be very complicated. And so far, we we don't think uh, it's feasible. So, and what about uh, multiple rounds of sorting with a different essay? Okay. Um, yeah, multiple rounds of sorting is possible. Yeah, it's possible. But usually um, we think that when uh, one round is enough, then we just uh, uh, go ahead to the uh, sequencing and the bioinformatics analysis to select the candidate sequences then we do the um, expression and the validation. And in the validation, we can perform um, binding assays against the different antigens. Okay, thanks very much. I think that's all the questions. And just let me double check here. You can still hear me? Yes, yeah, okay. very clearly. <laughs> Good, I don't know where I went to last time. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, in concluding, I would like to thank Dr. Xu for providing insights on innovative technologies and platforms that are used in antibody discovery. I thank you for joining the webinar today. An on-demand version will be available in about a day. I'll send a link to it via, everyone who, by, by email to everyone who registered. Please do feel free to watch this or any of our on-demand webinars when it's convenient. Thanks again, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.